Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to our spay neuter week. We have so much to talk about. So today is, we are going to talk about sterilization options for female dogs. Um, don't worry, cat people, we're going to get to you later in the week. Uh, but we're going to talk about sterilization options for female dogs. Oh, I just hit my camera. Yesterday, we talked about options for male dogs. Um, and by the way, today is National Change a Pet's Life Day. So this is great to be talking about this because we can change a lot of lives if we start changing the way that we think about some of the dogma that has existed for so, so, so many years. Um, just like we now are rethinking vaccine administration for our dogs and cats. And we're saying, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be doing that every single year. Maybe, maybe, just maybe those vaccines last a lot longer than we had been saying for decades. Um, so now we are looking at the effects of spay and neuter or removing, removing gonads, removing reproductive organs from the bodies of our pets. And um, looking at it from a scientific standpoint, and looking at studies to really understand what it is that we are doing when we start removing body parts. So um, I, I, have, I, have, I have a whole stack of studies that we're going through today. So this one will be a little bit, and I, I tried to break them apart into different sections, but eh, we'll get what we get. All right, so the first um, review is on behavior. Gonadectomy or removing reproductive organs is widely used to treat and prevent behavior problems, including the aggressive behavior of dogs. The aim of the study was to determine whether aggressive behavior toward familiar people, strangers, or other dogs was significantly different in dogs who had their reproductive organs removed at various ages versus intact dogs. So data for intact dogs were compared with those for dogs that um, were spayed or neutered at six months or less, seven to 12 months, 11 to 18 months, or greater than 18 months. Um, neither gonadectomy nor age at gonadectomy showed an association with aggression toward familiar people or dogs. However, there was a significant increase in the odds of moderate or severe aggression toward strangers for all gonectomized dogs compared with intact dogs. Um, there is no evidence that gonadectomy at any age alters aggressive behavior and there is, uh, toward familiar people or dogs, and there's only minimal increase, uh, toward strangers. Given the increasing evidence of significant negative health effects of gonadectomy, there is an urgent need to systematically examine other means of prevented, preventing unwanted procreation, such as vasectomy, um, and ovary sit bearing spay, doing something differently. Um, so this study um, looked at spayed or intact female dogs, and the results showed that dogs younger than one year of age that had already displayed dominance aggression to family members had a 50-50 chance of increased aggressive behavior after spay. Increased aggressive behavior after spay. Um, let's see, if they were left intact, they had a six to one chance of decreased aggressive behavior. So we can actually decrease that aggression by leaving them intact. The authors concluded that ovariohysterectomy should not be undertaken as a treatment for behavior problems and that spaying was associated with an increased risk of aggressive behavior. Now, this is one of those myths that we need to bust because for decades, veterinarians have been telling pet owners, oh, well, if they're aggressive, we need to spay or neuter. Eh, yeah, we'll probably make it worse. So myth busted. Um, so let's see, there was a study done on the effects of ovario hysterectomy on aggressive behavior in 14 German Shepherd dogs. Seven were gonectomized at the age of five to 10 months and seven littermate controls remained intact. Ovario hysterectomized dogs demonstrated significantly more barking, growling, lunging, snapping, widened eyes, lip lifting or curling in response to the approach of an unfamiliar human and dog. So 
those who were spayed. And that's a great study. When you have a litter of 14, you've got seven that you spay, seven you leave intact. And look at that. We got more aggression in the ones who were spayed. Hmm. Okay. All right. So that's that behavior study. Now, yesterday, um, I talked about autoimmune disease. We're going to talk about it again. So this was a study of greater than 90,000 records looked at retrospectively at the University of California Davis Veterinary School. And what they found that for dogs that were spayed or had their ovaries removed, they had a significantly greater risk of atopic dermatitis, that's allergies, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, myasthenia gravis, colitis, Addison's disease, which is where the adrenal glands don't function, hypothyroidism, immune-mediated polyarthritis, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, and pemphigus, which were much higher in females than in uh, spayed females than in intact females and also higher in all females compared to males. The data underscore the importance of sex steroids on immune function, emphasizing a role of these hormones on tissue self-recognition. -rec immune system tissues, the thymus, lymph nodes, and spleen display gonadal steroid receptors. So the immune system is intimately aligned with the endocrine system. Intact females showed the lowest risk for autoimmune disease. They have higher immunoglobulin production prompted by estrogen, and that enhances antibody production for stronger humoral and cell-mediated immunity. So they actually have less infections, less, um, less disease problems if they're left intact because those estrogens play a really important role in immune system function. All right, so this is looking at, um, it was kind of a retrospective study looking at um, like 35 different breeds of dogs. And let's see, so we know that certain cancers, um, certain cancers are more prevalent in dogs that have been spayed or neutered, had their gonads removed versus intact. Uh, the occurrence of lymphoma was found to be higher in spayed versus intact females, as was the occurrence of mast cell tumors and hemangiosarcoma. Um, neutered males and females were more likely to die of cancer than intact dogs. Uh, a recent finding was that the absence of estrogen from spaying females was associated with accelerated brain aging as well. Okay. Um, in female golden retrievers, neutering at any age was associated with an occurrence of one or more of the cancers, which were um, mast cell tumors, hemangiosarcoma, lymphosarcoma, and osteosarcoma uh, at two to four times higher than the incidence found in intact females. So if we leave our females intact, the incidence of these cancers shrinks drastically. Um, okay, I'm done with that one. All right. There is evidence that less exposure to sex hormones increases risk for other aggressive cancers, including osteosarcoma, bladder transitional cell carcinoma, prostate cancer, that's the boys, lymphoma, and mast cell tumors. So sex hormones may not be all bad and in fact may be protective against certain cancers. Osteosarcoma is the most common bone cancer in dogs, accounting for 85% of bone cancer cases. It is very aggressive and 90% of patients will die from spread of the disease within the first year when amputation is the only treatment. Purebred dogs who have been spayed are twice as likely to develop osteosarcoma than their intact counterparts. The risk is even higher for Rottweilers, and I think I have a Rottweiler study in here. Um, one study looked at 683 Rotties and showed that both male and female Rotties who were surgically sterilized before the age of one year had an approximately one in four risk for developing osteosarcoma during their lifetime, while intact Rotties were much less likely to develop the disease. Uh, spayed Rotties were four times more likely to develop osteosarcoma than their intact counterparts. 
Spaying has also been shown to increase the risk of lymphoma. Intact females had a significantly lower risk, not just lower than for female spayed dogs, but also lower risk for both intact and castra castrated males. Interesting, in people, women also have a lower risk for lymphoma than men. Um, and for all types of heart tumors, the relative risk for a spayed female was greater than four times that for intact female dogs. Right. This is a study exploring the mechanisms of sex differences in longevity, lifetime ovary exposure, and exceptional longevity in dogs. This is a great study. Uh, so to move closer to understanding the mechanistic underpinnings of sex differences in human longevity, we studied pet dogs to determine whether lifetime duration of ovary exposure was associated with exceptional longevity. This hypothesis was tested by collecting and analyzing lifetime medical histories, age at death, and cause of death for a cohort, cohort of canine centenarians, which are uh, defined as exceptionally long-lived Rottweiler dogs that lived more than 30% longer than average life expectancy for the breed. Uh, the average life expectancy for the breed is 9.4 years for all Rottweilers. And so um, sex and lifetime ovary exposure in the oldest old Rottweilers, age at death greater than 13 years, were compared to a cohort of Rottweilers that had unusual longevity with uh, age at death 8 to 10.8 years. Like women, female dogs were more likely than males to achieve exceptional longevity. Yay, women. Uh, however, removal of ovaries during the first years of life erased the female survival advantage. In females, that's four years. So spaying before four years in these rotties. In females, a strong positive association between ovaries and longevity persisted in multivariate analysis. The results document in dogs a female sex advantage for achieving exceptional longevity and show that lifetime ovary exposure is associated with exceptional longevity. Removal of ovaries during the first four years of life erased the female survival advantage over males. In females that retained their ovaries for more than four years, likelihood of exceptional longevity increased to more than three times that of males. So if you're a Rottweiler person, you might want to get a girl and you might want to leave her intact if you want to keep her for a long time. Uh, when females from the exceptional longevity and usual longevity cohorts were combined, then subdivided based upon ovary exposure during the first eight years of life, dogs with the longest ovary exposure, six to eight years, were 3.2 times more likely to reach exceptional longevity than dogs with the shortest exposure, i.e. those who were spayed early. Interestingly, they looked at these dogs, they broke them down into usual longevity and exceptional longevity. In the usual longevity, out of 100 dogs, 73 got cancer. In the exceptional longevity dogs, only 25 had cancer. And osteosarcoma, the usual longevity dogs, 38 had bone sarcoma and only six in the exceptional longevity. And remember, the exceptional longevity are the ones who kept their ovaries. So protecting against cancer and letting them live longer. Um, in Rottweilers with usual longevity, the major cause of death and major death category were osteosarcoma and cancer of all types, accounting for 38% and 73% of deaths respectively. So osteosarcoma, 38% of the deaths of those uh, normal lifespan dogs um, and overall cancer, 73% of them died of that. We found that after excluding bone cancers or all cancer deaths, the strong association between intact ovaries and excep exceptional longevity persisted. After excluding all cancer deaths, females who kept their ovaries dur during the first seven years of life were more than nine times more likely to reach exceptional longevity than females with the shortest ovary exposure. Our results show that in Rottweiler dogs, like in humans, there is a strong female sex advantage for reaching exceptional longevity. Importantly, the longevity advantage over males is abolished in females that undergo early or midlife ovarian removal. Our results mirror the recent findings from more than 29,000 women in the nurse's health study. In that study, women who had elective hysterectomy with ovary sparing had lower overall mortality than those who underwent hysterectomy with ovariectomy. 
Notably, the benefit of keeping ovaries experienced by women under 50 years was attributable to decreased cardiovascular and cancer mortality. Taken together, the findings from dogs and women support the hypothesis that early life physiological influences, such as ovarian hormones, lay the foundation for adult health outcomes, including longevity. Specific mechanisms have been proposed by which ovaries might promote longevity, including estrogen-induced enhanced immune response, which I just talked about, and protection against oxidative stress. And there's some really good studies showing that uh, the, the, horm the female hormones protect against oxidative stress, um, which is why we use so many antioxidants as supplements. We observed a robust ovarian association with longevity that was independent of cause of death, suggesting that a network of processes regulating the intrinsic rate of aging is under ovarian control. Go ovaries. All right. And this is a, another interesting study, but they um, did this with mice. Um, and the title of it is Age of Ovary Determines Remaining Life Expectancy in Old Ovariectomized Mice. So we investigated the capacity of young ovaries transplanted into old, basically spayed mice where the ovaries had been removed to improve remaining life expectancy of the hosts. So the donor females were sexually mature two-month-old mice. So these are two-month-old ovaries that they're going to transplant. And the recipients were mice who had been um, over ovariectomized at three weeks of age. And then they were given transplants of these two-month-old ovaries at five, eight, and 11 months of age. Relative to the ov ovariectomized control females, because we have to have a control if we're going to do a really good study. So those were ones who had their ovaries removed and didn't get any transplanted back in. Life expectancy at 11 months was increased by 60% in the 11-month-old recipient females and by 40% relative to intact control females. That's intact. So when we gave them a young ovary, not only did they live longer than regular mice. They also lived 60% longer um, than ones who didn't get any ovaries. Uh, only 20% of the 11 month transplant females died in the 300 day period following ovarian transplantation, whereas 65% of the control females died during that same period. The 11 month old recipient females resumed estrous cycles continued to cycle up to several months beyond the age of control female reproductive senescence. Across the three recipient age groups, transplantation of young ovaries increased life expectancy in proportion to the relative youth of the ovary. Yeah, I think we found the fountain of youth. Um, so uh, mortality rate is a graded function of the physiological age of the ovary. Ovarian physiological status can have opposite effects on mortality. A physiologically young ovary can decrease mortality while a physiologically old ovary can increase mortality. Eh, I got to figure out how to make mine younger. All right. So, um, so of those 11 month old recipients that got the two month old ovaries, they restored estrous cycling sometimes for 200 days beyond the age of last reproduction in the control females, which were just the normal mice. The young ovary retards both the somatic and so the body and reproductive aging of the host. Um, with few recent exceptions, little attention has been directed in gerontology to determine the role of reproduction in the senescence in senescence and longevity. The research results presented here show that transplanted young ovaries received by hosts at older ages can extend the lifespan. These data are the first to establish that ovarian function plays a direct role in how mammals age. All right, so we know that the, our ovaries are going to make us live longer. That's great. Um, we need our ovaries to decrease aggression. Great. Um, now we're going to talk about pyometra because this is one of those, yeah, but that we hear all the time. And this is another reason why your veterinarian is going to tell you, spay young because you don't want to deal with the pyometra. Um, so one study, which I don't have in here, but we had posted a link, I think last week, um, is that... Uh, over 97% of pyometra surgeries done in a non-specialized setting, i.e. at um, shelter or humane society hospitals, over 97% of them survive surgery 
with no problems. Um, so pyometra is treatable. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in here as well. Um, and I don't think that the fear of pyometra is uh, a good enough reason not to spay when we have so much evidence of reasons. Or, I, I don't think avoiding pyometra is a good enough reason to have an early spay when we have all these reasons why leaving ovaries there is so important. Um, so this is a breed matched case control study of potential risk factors for canine pyometra. And it was done in Sweden uh, because most of their dogs there are intact. The objective was to evaluate plausible risk factors for pyometra, a common disease affecting almost 25% of all unspayed female dogs before 10 years of age. This is in Sweden. Because of the strong breed predilection, an age and breed matched case control study was undertaken on 87 pairs of pyometra case and a healthy control uh, from five breeds. So they did Rottweiler, Collie, Golden Retriever, Labrador Retriever, and German Shepherds. The mean age was 7.9 years. And they looked at false pregnancies, age at first estrus, um, hormone treatments, whether or not they had had litters, um, all kinds of different things to, 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 as controls for what they were looking at. Um, so analyzing interactions with breed, previous pregnancy was statistically associated with pyometra. In three breeds, previous pregnancy was protective, the Rottweiler, the Collie, and the Labrador Retriever. So if they had had a litter, they were less likely to develop pyometra. Um, and then for the German Shepherd dog, it was statistically intermediate when compared to the baseline, which was the Golden Retriever. Previous pregnancy was a statistically significant factor that had a protective offense against pyometra in all the breeds they looked at, but not in the Golden Retriever. Really interesting. Um, these findings indicate the protective and risk factors may vary between different breeds. So is there a genetic component to this? What else goes into this? Pyometra is a common disease in countries such as Sweden where spaying neutering is not generally practiced and is diagnosed in nearly 25% of all intact female dogs before 10 years of age. The potentially life-threatening disease is characterized by uterine infection and inflammation in combination with systemic illness. Hormonal factors as well as bacterial infection are involved in the development of the disease. Large age and breed-related differences with respect to occurrence have been reported. Estrogen therapy and never having had a litter have been associated with increased risk for pyometra, whereas uh, false pregnancy has been linked with a reduced risk of developing the disease, which is interesting because I always thought that was the opposite. So if I had dogs who were having repeated false pregnancies, I would recommend spaying them. So we're learning something. Okay. So pyometra is a bacterial infection of the uterus that occurs as a consequence of changes in the uterine environment brought about by repeated estrous cycles. Pyometra can be treated medically. I didn't say surgically. I said medically. With resolution of infection reported in 46 to 95% of cases with minimal short-term complications and with relatively high rates of reoccurrence, so 20 to 25% will reoccur and they may have subsequent fertility problems. It is more commonly treated and recurrence is prevented by spaying at the time of the pyometra being found. I will say that I had a Doberman breeder um, who had show dogs, performance dogs, and one of hers did develop a pyometra and she did not want to spay the dog. And we used acupuncture herbs and antibiotics, got the dog through the uh, pyo with no problems. She was successfully bred after that and had a healthy litter of puppies. So it can be treated. The big thing, if you are going to keep your females intact, you need to know the signs and symptoms of pyometra. You need to be aware of it. It usually occurs uh, You'll see it six to eight weeks after they go through their, their heat cycle. Um, you may have a vaginal discharge. You may not have a vaginal discharge. They usually they'll start drinking more water. Their appetite may be off. They're a little lethargic. So if you're keeping them intact, know the symptoms, know what to watch for, be an informed owner. Because if you're a responsible, informed owner, then your veterinarian can't argue too much with you. Um, and then they did... Um, they did look at cancer of other reproductive organs. Um, so tumors of the ovaries are uncommon in dogs. Um, 
I never saw an ovarian tumor uh, in dogs. Um, uterine tumors are even more rare. Um, and tumors of the vulva and vaginal vault in female dogs are also not very common. Uh, they occur primarily in intact females, often have receptors for ovarian hormones, um, but most of them are benign. And I think I probably saw in 36 years of practice, two or three vaginal tumors. So not common. Okay. Let's talk about mammary tumors. Cause here's the other one where your veterinarian is absolutely going to say, no, 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 your dog's going to die of mammary cancer if we don't get them spayed. Um, so this is a population-based incidence of mammary tumors in some dog breeds. Data from two population-based studies in four Norwegian co counties, because again, in Norway, they usually don't spay and neuter, were used to calculate the crude incidence of mammary tumors and the age and breed-specific incidence of mammary tumors in female dogs of three different breeds. The largest study comprised 14,401 histologically veri verified tumor cases from four counties covered by the Norwegian Canine Cancer Registry, which covers about 25% of the total Norwegian dog population. The highest relative risk ratio of mammary tumors was found in boxers, cocker spaniels, English Springer spaniels, and dachshunds. The mean age of histologically diagnosed mammary tumors was 7.9 years in boxers, 7.8 years in springers, compared with 8.8 .8 years in all other breeds. The population-based incidence rates for all ages of malignant mammary tumors per 1,000 female dogs per year was 35.47 in boxers. So that's 35 out of 1,000 in boxers. For Bernese Mountain Dogs, 3.87, so less than four per thousand Bernese Mountain Dogs, and 17.69 in the Bichon Frise. Mammary cancer is the most common tumor in female dogs in Norway and represents a population of almost entirely reproductively intact females. The age-specific incidence rates for mammary cancer vary considerably among the three breeds that were studied in detail. Okay, so this is a Swedish study on the incidence of and survival after mammary tumors in a population of over 80,000 female dogs in Sweden. Uh, the main objective of the study was to describe the incidence of, mammary, incidence of mammary tumors and the survival after mammary tumors in female dogs between 3 and 10 years of age. The overall incidence for mammary tumors was 111 dogs per 10,000 dog years at risk. The incidence for any mammary tumor uh, increased with age and varied by breed from 319 dogs per 10,000 dog years in the English Springer Spaniel to five dogs per 10,000 dog years in the rough-haired Collie. At the ages six, eight, and 10 years, 1%, 6%, and 13% respectively of all females had at least one mammary tumor claim. Uh, the mammary tumor mortality was six deaths per 10,000 dog years which increased with age, the overall case fatality was 6%. So um, we have to look at what's the percentage of dogs that even got mammary tumors. So 111 dogs per 10,000 dog years and an overall case fatality of 6% in those 111 dogs. So it's like six or seven dogs. So it just because you leave your female dog intact does not guarantee that she's going to get mammary cancer. All right. So this is another Swedish study. Um, breed variations in the incidence of pyometra and mammary tumors in Swedish dogs. So 260,000 female dogs with over a million dog years at risk in the database using data on uh, female dogs up to 10 years of age and 110 breeds. In total, 20,423 female intact dogs were diagnosed with pyometra out of 260,000, and 11,758 out of the 260,000 had uh, mammary tumors. The mean age of diagnosis of pyometra was seven years, and for mammary tumors, eight years. In all breeds, the overall proportion of dogs that developed disease by 10 years of age for pyometra was 19%, and mammary tumors was 13%. The top 10 breeds diagnosed with either or both of the two diseases were 73% for the Leon Barger, 69% for the Irish Wolfhound, 69% for Bernese Mountain Dog, 68% for Great Dane, 66% for uh, 
Staffordshire Bull Terriers, 65% for Rotties, 62% for Bull Terriers, 62% for Dobermans, 60% for Bouvier, and 60% for Airedales. Breed variations in incidence rate suggest genetic components in de disease development as well, and we don't know all of those yet. Okay. Uh, all right. This is another study on canine mammary tumors. The frequency of mammary cancer in different species varies tremendously. The dog is by far the most frequently affected domestic species with a prevalence three times that of women. 50% of all tumors in the uh, female dog are mammary tumors. Approximately 45% of those mammary tumors are malignant in dogs. The cause of mammary tumors is unknown in any species except mice in which an uncornavirus is causative in certain inbred strains. Interesting that a virus causes cancer. I think, I think maybe when there's enough research out there, we're going to find that a lot of cancers are related to different viral problems. Hormones play an important part in the hyperplasia and neoplasia cancer of mammary tissue, but the exact mechanism is unknown. Estrogen or progesterone receptors or both have been reported on mammary tumor cells in animals. These may influence the pathogenesis of hormone-induced mammary cancer as well as the response to hormone therapy. Genetic and nutritional effects on mammary cancer have been identified. In dogs, there's one single nucleotide uh, on the BRCA gene um, and one in BRCA1 and one in BRCA2, um, similar to people that were found to be significantly associated with canine mammary tumors. It has been demonstrated, this is really interesting, the consumption of red meat, obesity at one year of age, and obesity a year before diagnosis were associated with an increased risk of mammary gland tumors in intact or spayed dogs. Don't let them be fat. And the consumption of red meat, that's really interesting. And I think we need a lot more study on that um, because I think part of the problem is what kind of red meat. Like, are they eating confinement raised red meat? Or are they eating organic red meat? Probably a lot of confinement raised. So I don't, we, I'd, I'd like to see more studies on that. I'm just telling you what this one says. Uh, but we do know that obesity increases the risk of mammary tumors. Um, so uh, ovariectomy before the first heat reduces mammary risk of uh, neoplasia to 0.5% of the risk of intact females. After that, it's a big question. They will, you will read statistics, one heat, 8%, two heats, 26%. Those statistics are all over the internet. However, a recent systematic review of the literature based on Cochrane guidelines found that the association between the age at spaying and the risk of mammary cancer was weak. In addition, any potential benefit in reduced risk of mammary cancer may be overcome by the increase in overall cancer risks like lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma that are associated with early age ovariectomy which is performed on a patient less than two years of age, especially in certain breeds of dogs, because we have great studies in golden retrievers, visas, and Rottweilers. Questions also remain regarding the impact of, of ovariohysterectomy at the time of tumor excision. So if they have a mammary tumor, does spaying them at the time of removing the tumors help? Don't know. Um, so we have no idea if that surgery increases survival time or not. Um, but the good news is uh, more than 50% of canine mammary tumors are benign. So yay. We'll have a different conversation when we talk about kitty cats. Um, so current dogma is that prepubital ovariectomy or ovary variohysterectomy will reduce the lifetime risk of mammary cancer in dogs. However, a systematic review of the literature found that the association between the age of spaying and the risk of mammary cancer was weak. It is important to note that prepubertal gonad removal, so before sexual maturity or before two years, they're saying, may also increase the lifetime risk of other cancers, lymphoma, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, um, and histologic diagnosis after tumor removal is critical to accurately identify the disease, develop a correct treatment plan, and provide the client with the most realistic prognosis. All right, more on mammary cancer. 
Studies have reported highly variable rates of mammary cancer among different breeds and among dogs uh, neutered at different ages. One study found a mammary cancer prevalence of 3.5% in female golden retrievers under nine years of age who were neutered between two and eight, and no mammary tumors in intact female females or dogs neutered before two years of age. However, the same study found a similar prevalence of 2% in female Labrador retrievers neutered between two and eight years of age and no mammary tumors, those neutered before two years old, but a prevalence of 1.4% in intact females, very similar to the rate in late neutered females. I mean, 1.4%, that's pretty low. But then we have a four times greater risk with spaying of hemangiosarcoma, lymphosarcoma, osteosarcoma versus 1.4%. Systematic review of the literature on neutering and mammary tumors in dogs found the, that most studies had a high risk of bias. Of the four studies with only a moderate risk of bias, two found neutering to be protective against mammary neoplasia and two found no association. While the existing evidence does suggest neutering reduces the risk of mammary tumors in dogs, the quality of this evidence is low and there is great variation among studies and populations. Strong or specific claims about the preventative value of neutering with respect to mammary neoplasia are not justified. All right. All right. This is a study that just got published five days ago. Uh, so this study, they say, was the first to examine the health and behavior outcomes of dogs that underwent vasectomy or ovary sparing spay. So somebody asked yesterday, but have, do we have studies on dogs that have had a vasectomy? Yeah, we do. Here you go. <laughs> uh, to compare those outcomes to sexually intact or gonectomized dogs. We hypothesized that the increased exposure to gonadal hormones would give these dogs health and behavioral profiles similar to sexually intact dogs because we're leaving the ovaries, we're leaving the testes. Our most important finding was that longer duration that gonads were present, regardless of reproductive status, was associated with fewer general health problems and both problematic and nuisance behaviors. It was also associated with an increased lifespan. Because uh, vasectomy and ovary sparing spay permit dogs to experience longer gonadal hormone exposure times, these data suggest that when electing surgery to prevent reproduction, dogs might benefit from these alternative surgeries with respect to general health huh, who to thunk, and experience better behavior outcomes compared to undergoing traditional spay-neuter surgery. Delaying traditional spay-neuter surgery could offer similar, similar benefits. Being sexually intact or having an ovary ovary sparing spay were associated with lower odds of orthopedic problems consistent with other studies. Our data also showed that orthopedic conditions were more common in larger dogs and older dogs. Our results were also consistent with previous studies indicating that the associated odds of cancer is significantly lower for sexually intact dogs versus those uh, that were gonad gonadectomized. Uh, the finding of more cancer in larger dogs is also consistent with previous research. Our data also indicated that the associated prevalence of both problematic and nuisance behaviors decreased with increased exposure to gonadal hormones. These data demonstrated potential health and behavior benefits to dogs of both sexes experiencing longer exposure to gonadal hormones. Given the relatively low risk of these alternative surgeries, vasectomy and ovary sparing spay, particularly in the hands of experienced veterinary practitioners, veterinarians might consider offering, this is written in a veterinary journal, might consider offering these alternative reproductive surgeries to allow dogs to obtain these benefits without experiencing unintentional reproduction. There is a need for studies examining whether there are any long-term hormone-related consequences of removal of the uterus with retention of the ovaries. However, in a rat model study where they did ovarian sparing, ovary sparing spay and remove the uterus, they showed decreased brain function as a result of removal of just the uterus. So the uterus is not a dead lump that lays there and does nothing. It's actually doing something. It's producing hormones. It's producing things that have an effect on the body as well. So more that we don't know. Um, so this evidence supports the 2021 statement by Dr. Kendall Houlihan, the AVMA's Associate Director of Animal Welfare. AVMA, quote, AVMA promotes the professional judgment of the veterinarian in developing an informed case-by-case -case assessment of each individual patient, taking into account all the potential risks and benefits of spay-neuter. 
We encourage veterinary schools to discuss with their students the evidence for the various surgical options available to prevent reproduction while optimizing the health and behavior of dogs. Well, that's the ABMA's position. How many of you have been told by your veterinarian, oh no, we have to neuter him or he's going to be aggressive. He's going to mark. He's going to hump. He's going to attack. He's going to get testicular cancer. He's going to get prostate cancer. We talked about all that yesterday. Myth, 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 myth. How many of you have been told your dog will die of pyometra if you don't spay her early? Your dog will die of mammary cancer if you don't spay her early. Myth, 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 myth. We need to change the narrative and the veterinarians can't pick and choose what they want to believe from the AVMA and what they don't want to believe from the AVMA. So um, that statement, I'm sure you can find on the AVMA website. Um, it was a 2021 statement by their associate director of animal welfare um, because we need to change the narrative and we need to start having conversations with veterinarians about doing things differently instead of having our animals have these hugely increased risks, particularly for the large breed dogs of cancers and behavior problems and hormonal issues, all these different things. Um, I did find a couple of studies that were linking um, kind of the crisis, uh, adrenal gland crisis that we're having with um, Addison's disease and Cushing's disease, which is the two opposite ends of the adrenal gland not functioning correctly. I found some studies that indicated that removing um, the gonads had an effect on that. And then I found other studies where it said there was no relation. So that one's st still still out for consideration. All right, so sterilization options for our female dogs. Ovario hysterectomy, traditional spay. It's the most common sterilization procedure in the US. The ovaries and the uterus are both removed. Mm, let's see, we just opened up a big risk for osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, mast cell cancer, decreased brain function, um, aggression, what else did we talk about? All kinds of things. Um, in female dogs, the ovario hysterectomy eliminates the risk of pyometra and pregnancy and heat cycles are eliminated. So, you know, gosh forbid, I don't really want to have to deal with that mess. Um, removing the ovaries and uterus also eliminates the risk of a false pregnancy, which, huh, one study showed that that's actually protective against pyo. So false pregnancies mimic true pregnancies resulting in abnormal behaviors as well as, uh, oh, we got to change that in our blog. Um, so let's see. So the next choice is ovariectomy or a laparoscopic spay where they just remove the ovaries, but leave the uterus. Well, that's great. They won't get pregnant. They still can get a pio. I think this is, this one's like my least favorite. Um, they can get a stump pio if it's not done. Um, oh no, ovary, ovar sorry. Ovariectomy, <laughs> Gwen's over there correcting me. Ovariectomy, when we take the hormones away, the chances of a pio are really slim. Um, it's probably not going to happen. So you're not going to get pregnant. You're going to eliminate the risk of pio, most likely. Um, but we've taken away the ovaries with the protective hormones. So I don't really like that option. Um, and then we have ovary sparing spay, which is where we take out the uterus and leave the ovaries. So they can't get pregnant. They still, um, they can't get a pio unless too much of the ovarian stump is left. You can get a stump pio. They're not that common. You just need a good surgeon doing this. The ovaries are there. So you still have all the hormonal input that is needed for all the protective things that we just talked about. Um, so ovary sparing spay is a great option. Um, and if need be, and the ovaries needed to come out for whatever reason, later on, you still could go back and remove them. Um, so I think we need to look at this one really long and hard as leaving the ovaries there, because I think that this is going to give us the, the most protection. Um, and you know what, uh, ovary sparing spay is not hard. Pretty much anybody who can do a spay can do an ovary sparing spay. You take out the uterus and you just leave the ovaries alone. Um, for, for all my years in practice, uh, because all we did was traditional spay and neuter. One of the worst things that you could do was to leave a piece of ovary behind because the 
dog or cat would continue to have heat cycles. And owners hate that. It's like, oh, geez. And then we'd have to go back and get the piece of ovary we left behind. Now I'm thinking, well, we should have just left it there. Would have been a lot better off. But you don't know what you don't know at the time. So I like ovary sparing spay. And then our other option <coughs> is tubal ligation, which this is what's done most commonly, in, I think, in female humans to stop chances of getting pregnant. All the organs stay there. You just tie off the tube between the ovary and the uterus so no eggs can swim down and get impregnated. Um, heat cycles will continue. You still have the risk of pyo and uh, all the other things that we talked about. However, you know, there's a lot of good stuff with leaving, leaving parts and pieces where they belong. So it's just time to rethink what we're doing, to have a different conversation about what we're doing with our animals, um, to really look hard at what breed of, of dog do you have? Is your dog, um, there was a, that one study that I mentioned that they looked at 35 different breeds. Um, they, that was actually printed in a veterinary journal a couple years ago where they looked at the incidence of, um, bone cancers, mammary cancers, pios, that sort of thing on a lot of different breeds of dogs. And then they just had this table of, um, if you've got a Roddy, a Golden, a Vishla, these dogs that we know, um, you know, these larger breeds of dogs where we know that they have a higher risk of bone cancer and some of these other problems, leaving them intact longer. Like the chart said, leave them intact longer. When we got down to some of the smaller breeds um, where we have less of those problems, it was kind of like, yeah, we don't really know yet. There haven't been any really good studies on those. Um, maybe spaying them early is, is still okay. Personally, I think the longer you can leave ovaries there, the better. I think we have mounting evidence, like lots of mounting evidence that we need to look at. So why did I spay my female dog? I spayed my female dog when I got her at four years of age. Um, every other dog that I have ever gotten came spayed because they all came through rescue. She was a private um, adoption from a breeding program. Um, I spayed her because I didn't have all this information, frankly. Had I had all this information, I probably would have done ovary sparing. Um, I didn't have all this information back then quite a few years ago. So there you go. You don't know what you don't know. And we are learning so much more all the time. And that's why we look at things differently. Yeah. Uh, a lot of regular vets do not do these surgeries yet, but it's really nice. And this, that latest article that I just referenced that came out in the journal, the American Veterinary Medical Association, January 19th of 2023, five days ago, five days ago. So this is uh, the rant I did about metronidazole. That came out in a veterinary journal just a couple of months ago. Uh, I did a rant probably six months ago about not using antibiotics, really strong antibiotics for urinary tract infections, particularly without a culture. That came out in the veterinary journal. We are starting finally, finally to change the paradigm changed the narrative and no, it, it, how many years did it take us to get, I mean, and there's still some veterinarians who are bulking. How many years has it taken to get veterinarians to understand that we don't have to vaccinate every year, that we can use titers, that we have a better way to do that. And so now we're looking at, is there a better way to, to our spay neuter paradigm? Is there a better way? I, I, I'm, at some point we're going to get to the point of, Hey, maybe we shouldn't be killing them with chemicals, but you know, we're one battle at a time. So this one is coming to the forefront. Um, I'm seeing that all the holistic veterinarians are talking about this right now. Um, don't know why it came up all of a sudden, but anyway, we kind of started talking about it last July <laughs> and here we are again still. All right, everyone have a wonderful day. Tomorrow, we have a special guest joining me and we're going to talk about some of the weird things we have seen reproductively in veterinary practice. So uh, we'll see what what weird things Dr. Koger has seen. And I'll talk about a couple of the weird anomalies that I've seen in practice. So, oh, we'll talk about crypt orchids tomorrow too. Okay. Yeah, we'll be talking about crypt orchids tomorrow because that's a totally different deal. All right. We good to go? Some music? Some something? <laughs>